buffers. How often have you thought about the buffers you use in your flow cytometry experiment? I'm going to guess not very often. Today, we're going to look at some common additives to flow cytometry buffers and how they can make or break your experiments. Let's take a look. If you've watched any of our previous episodes, you'll know that quite often I talk about the importance of sample prep. Your flow cytometry experiment is only going to be as good as your sample preparation, or like we say in the field, garbage in, garbage out. Now your sample prep needs to start from a good foundation. In this case, your buffers. The wrong buffer choice can really make or break your experiment, so having the correct buffers is critical to your sample preparation. Now why does sample prep matter so much? Well, the key to all sample prep is keeping your cells alive. Dead cells will wreak havoc on a flow cytometry experiment. They increase clumping, they increase autofluorescence, and they're going to reduce your ability to resolve your positives from your negatives. Avoiding them at all costs is really quite important. And a big culprit in causing cell death is actually your buffers. So let's take a look at some common buffers, some common buffer components, and where these additives can improve your science, but also take away from your experiment. So you'll notice when you look at flow cytometry buffers, most of them start with a common base. This is either PBS or phosphate buffered saline or HBSS, Hangst Balanced Salt Solution. Now you might see other forms as a base solution, but these two are by far the most common. Um, you can try other bases, they just need to follow the same basic rules. First and foremost, you never want to have phenol red in your buffers. Phenol red will affect your ability to detect fluorescence. Second of all, you want to make sure you avoid magnesium and calcium, as the magnesium and calcium ions can cause your cells to clump, and that is, again, a big no-no when you want single cells. So you might sometimes see things written as PBS minus minus, that really just denotes PBS with no magnesium and no calcium. Now, in addition to these base buffers, almost every single flow cytometry buffer will include protein, so either serum or BSA. Um, I've generally always used serum, but BSA works very nicely as well. For the most part, serum is going to fall somewhere between that 1 to 5% concentration, while BSA will be kind of 0.1 to 1%. The big thing you want to avoid when you add proteins to your buffers is adding too much. Like phenol red, too much protein will affect your ability to detect your fluorescence. So why do we add proteins to our buffer? Well, first and foremost, they do help keep your cells a little bit happier. Um, they provide some of the things that your cells like and require to live. Second of all, they will prevent some non-specific interactions between your reagents and your cells. They kind of coat the outside of your cells in protein and prevent things from binding where they shouldn't be binding. Along those same lines, while the proteins prevent things from sticking to your cells, they may also help your cells from sticking to each other, so will help prevent cell clumping. The reason why I like to use serum is because it has antibodies in it that naturally occur in the host that your serum's from. Generally cow, because most people use FBS or fetal bovine serum. This is really nice because it provides a blocking reagent that's continuously in your buffer at no extra cost. Now, if you are going to be using the naturally occurring antibodies in the serum as a blocking reagent, I recommend doing this at about a 10% concentration and then dropping back down to that 1-5% to range when you go back to do your staining. Now, you'll hear this as a common theme through every single additive I'm going to talk about. You will need to test your percentages. Whether you're using serum or BSA, you will need to run a pilot test as serum can affect your autofluorescence and so adding too much can affect your ability to separate negative from positive. Another common additive you'll see is EDTA. This is usually added in about a 0.5 to 5 millimolar concentration in the solution. EDTA prevents cation-dependent cell-to-cell adhesion, or cell clumping. Now, it's not going to be needed in every single buffer. Like anything else, you will need to test it. 
but generally if you're working with really adherent cells or sticky cells like macrophages, it will be critical to maintaining that single cell solution. Like anything else, in addition to testing whether or not your cell is needed, you will need to test the concentration as too much EDTA can start to kill your cells. Looking now at some additives that are less commonly used, the first one is heapies or heaps. I've heard it both ways. I like heapies. So this is generally added at about a 10 to 25 millimolar. And what it does is increase the CO2 buffering in your, the CO2 buffering capacity of your buffer basically allows your cells to respire properly without the pH getting too high. By maintaining a proper pH, your cells will be happier. So heapies is really good when you have long incubations or when you're doing things like cell sorting, when your cells are going to be in the buffer for a long time. An other added benefit of heapies is it seems to shore up the cell membrane or make it a little bit more sturdy. This again helps with your sorting and your downstream applications because a cell that is more sturdy and happier going through the machine is more likely to come out happier and alive. DNAs is something you may also see added in some flow cytometry buffers. It's commonly used when you're expecting a lot of cell death. So generally when you're doing things from a tissue and you have to mash it up, you're going to have more cell death, more cell contents have been released, and so there's going to be DNA floating around in there. And DNA is cell Velcro, it sticks your cells together. So adding DNAs breaks apart that cell Velcro and brings your cells back into a single cell solution. Now an important thing with DNAs is when you use it, you need to have an appropriate concentration of magnesium chloride. So when adding your DNAs, you need to not only titrate the amount of DNAs that you're adding, but also the amount of magnesium chloride to get the proper reaction. Taking a step back, before starting to add DNAs to your solutions, I would recommend taking a step backwards and figuring out what is causing the cell death during your sample prep, and if you can avoid some of that without needing to add DNAs. In some cases it may not be avoidable, but troubleshooting your entire sample preparation workflow may allow you to avoid adding this into your buffer. And last, but certainly not least, we have azide. Now, azide is generally added to buffers to prevent bacterial and fungal growth so that your buffers can be stored for a long time. Um, I've generally not used it unless I need it for an assay. So in addition to preventing bacterial and fungal growth, azide will also affect your cells. So anytime you're using it for downstream functional assays, like if you're sorting your cells, or if you want to look at metabolic activity or other functional activities, azide will affect all of these. So my recommendation is only to use azide if absolutely necessary. It's better to make your buffers fresh every day than to store them long-term with azide and have the potential effects that azide could have on your cells affecting your experiments. All that being said, azide does have a place. So if you're doing experiments where you're looking at antigen capping, internalization, shedding of surface antigens or antibody internalization, azide is a nice control because it will inhibit all of those things. If you're working in that area, it's a great additive as a control to stop those. But other than that, I would not recommend the use of azide. Oh, buffers. Who knew there was so much to say about buffers? This video has gotten way too long. So I'm going to cut it here and you'll have to stay tuned for part two on fixatives and part three on permeabilization buffers, which will be coming out really soon. And on that note, make sure you've subscribed so you don't miss them. Later.